Søren Kierkegaard, Various Readings Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7, Søren Kierkegaard, by David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota, Editor A. M. Sturdivant, February 1920, Chapters 7 and 8, Pages 27 through 36. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Corsair and Works of Love Chapter 7 Despite the isolation which the unremitting labor of his authorship naturally imposed, Kierkegaard managed to keep in closest touch with his contemporaries. Although he received no visitors at home, parenthesis, except such as came to him for assistance, to whom his door was always open, in parenthesis, he spent much time on the streets, talking with the acquaintances he chanced to meet, professors at the university, editors of Copenhagen newspapers, politicians and officials, writers and students, and men about town or striking up a conversation with some casual passer-by. In this way he took his recreation of the afternoon, when he did not vary the program by one of his frequent carriage rides into the country. He took pains to make himself generally accessible, and the promiscuity of his intercourse was noticeable. This contact with men on the street had a considerable personal significance for him, among other things, it helped to enrich his literary vocabulary. What you have vainly sought for in books, says Frater Taciturnus, is suddenly illuminated for you while listening to a servant girl as she talks with another servant girl. An expression that you have vainly attempted to torture out of your own head you hear in passing. A soldier boy says it, and he does not dream how rich he is. End of that quotation. He felt that his mode of life tended to undermine the ideal conception of an aloof greatness, which the public might otherwise have formed of him. He notes Shakespeare's testimony in King Henry the Fourth to the method by which quote, a great host of kings and emperors and spiritual dignitaries, Jesuits and diplomats and clever people of all kinds. Unquote, have known how to profit by the illusion of distance, so as to enhance their personal reputation. But he would not adopt this method, preferring to give the situation the stamp of truth. Quote, All the unselfish witnesses for the truth have always been accustomed to mingle much with men. They have never played hide-and-seek with the multitude. End quote. Simultaneously with the completion of the postscript, Kierkegaard ventured upon a step that resulted in placing him in a still more conspicuous position before the Copenhagen public. He became a standing comic figure in the most widely circulated journal of the town, the Corsair. This sheet had obtained a considerable ascendancy as a vehicle for ironical, leveling attacks upon well-known men, and was much feared. Kierkegaard thus describes its influence. The whole population of Copenhagen had become ironical and witty, especially in proportion as it was ignorant and crude. There was nothing but irony first and irony last. If the matter had not been so serious, if I could bring myself to regard it from a purely ascetic standpoint, I would not wish to deny that it was the most ridiculous phenomenon I had ever witnessed. I believe that it would be necessary to travel far and wide, and even so be favored of fortune, before one could find anything so fundamentally comical. The whole population of a town, all these many thousands, became, quote, ironical, end quote. They became ironical by the aid of a journal, which again, ironically enough, by the aid of straw men as editors, succeeded in striking the dominant note, and the tone struck was, 
the ironical. I believe it impossible to imagine anything more ridiculous. Irony presupposes a specific intellectual culture, which in every generation is very rare, and this chaos of people were ironical. But the matter was only too serious. This irony was, of course, nothing but in essence vulgarity, and in spite of a not inconsiderable degree of talent in the man who was its originating force, by passing over into these thousands of people, it became, essentially, a mob trait, a trait which is always only too popular. In view of the proportions of the little country, it threatened a complete moral dissolution. One must envisage at close range how no attack is so much feared as that which singles one out as an object of laughter. How even one who would bravely risk death for a stranger is not far from betraying his own father or mother when the danger is that of being laughed at. For such an attack isolates the victim more than any other, and at no point does it offer him the support of pathos. Frivolity and curiosity and vulgarity grin. The nervous cowardice, which itself trembles for fear of such an attack, cries that it is nothing. The wretched cowardice, which by the use of bribery or good words protects itself, cries that it is nothing. And even sympathy says that it is nothing. It is a terrible thing when in a little land idle prattle and vulgar grimaces threaten to constitute public opinion. End of that quotation. In parenthesis, the word abbreviated. The publisher of the sheet in question was a talented young man who was himself an admirer of Kierkegaard, and the Corsair had more than once praised the pseudonyms to the skies. Victor Aramida had been pronounced immortal. From a sketch in the journals at the time, it appears that Kierkegaard had projected a reply to this pronouncement, asking to be spared the distinction. A little later, an opportunity offered itself, apropos of an article published by P. L. Moliere's literary yearbook, Gaia, Earth, in which Moliere had made some irresponsible animadversions upon the third part of Stages on the Way of Life bringing it into connection with the gossip current in Copenhagen about Kierkegaard's engagement. This gentleman had described himself in the Dictionary of Authors as a regular contributor to the Corsair, author of pieces, quote, both lyrical and satirical, end quote. Frater Taciturnus replied to the criticism, taking a very superior tone, and took advantage of the fact just mentioned to add the following remark at the end. Now may I soon be put into the Corsair. It is pretty hard for an author to be so singled out in Danish literature that he, parenthesis, assuming that we pseudonyms are one, in parenthesis, is the only one who is not vilified in its pages. My own principal, hilarious bookbinder, has been flattered in the Corsair if my memory serves me right, and Victor Eremita has even had to endure the disgrace of being immortalized in the Corsair. And yet have I not already been there? For ubi spiritus ibi ecclesia, ubi pl moliere, ibi the Corsair. Where the spirit is, there is the church. Where pl moliere is, there is the Corsair. Our literary tramp, therefore, characteristically, winds up his, quote, visit to Sorrow, end quote, with one of these wretched Corsair attacks upon peaceable and respectable men who in honorable seclusion follow their vocations in the service of the state. Excellent men, in many ways deserving well, and in none having made themselves worthy of ridicule end of that quotation. Nothing daunted by the delicacy of its own situation, the Corsair took up the gauntlet flung at it with an attack on Frater Taciturnus, the silent brother, who could not restrain himself. 
but had to reveal the secrets of the corsair entrusted to him in confidence. Frater Taciturnus countered with a summary article, quote, the dialectical result of a piece of police work, end quote. With respect to a sheet like the Corsair, which though read generally and by all sorts of people, has hitherto enjoyed the distinction of being ignored and despised, never answered, absolutely the only thing that could be done in a literary way was for one who had been praised and immortalized in its pages to ask to be vilified, thus expressing the moral literary order of things as reflected in the contrary order which this sheet has done its best to establish. I assume that the procedure adopted has met with success. One can therefore engage vilification at the hands of the corsair, just as one can hire a hurdy-gurdy to make music. I can do no more for others than this, to ask to be attacked myself. The falling cleverness of the corsair and of its collective secret helpers the professional tradesmen of wit and vulgarity, ought to be, and shall be, ignored in our literature, just as in civic life one ignores the public prostitute. The way is now open, and as the pseudonyms say, the method is changed. Everyone who is insulted by receiving the praise of this sheet can, if he happens to learn of the fact, reply, and thus testify to the judgment that decent literature has passed on the corsair. It is to be permitted to pursue its livelihood by way of vilification and attack as much as it likes. But if it dares to praise, it shall meet with this brief reply. Quote, May I ask to be attacked? It is an unendurable disgrace to be immortalized in the corsair. End of that quotation. Kierkegaard did not pursue the polemic further, but the Corsair kept up a steady fire of satire and caricature for many months. Kierkegaard was featured as he went about the streets, his umbrella under his arm. The thinness of his legs and the uneven length of his trousers were portrayed as characteristic idiosyncrasies, while vanity and pride were described as his besetting sins. It became exceedingly unpleasant for Kierkegaard to show himself on the streets in his accustomed manner. The mob grinned. Boys and hoodlums greeted him with a chorus of nicknames, and passers-by took occasion to inspect his trousers. If he stopped to talk with anyone, it made his interlocutor an object of embarrassing attention. So deep did the campaign sink into the popular consciousness that during this period and afterward one might find a nurse attempting to correct a child for faults of dress by calling it, quote, Sir, end quote. Kierkegaard was not insensible, and the journals show how profoundly the experience affected him. As usual, his reflection explored all its various phases in an objectifying and idealizing manner. We have, as a byproduct, profound estimates of the press and its influence on public opinion, probing its anonymity and its irresponsibility in relation to characteristic features of modern life. On the other side, the aloofness and indifference which he met in relation to the matter from the side of the higher circles in which it had previously been urged privately that something ought to be done about the Corsair but where there was now maintained the most complete silence, leaving Kierkegaard to bear the brunt of the attack alone. This prudent aloofness confirmed Kierkegaard in his view of the mediocrity of the world and gave a characteristic coloring to the religious literature that followed. In his subsequent description of the religious life, the inner collision by which a man comes into conflict with himself a collision which had been the chief burden of his early delineation, began to yield precedence to the external collision, in which a man, in the pursuit of his duty, comes into conflict with his environment, a conflict 
whereby the performance of this duty becomes an act of true self-denial. A passage from The Works of Love will illustrate the new emphasis, which is characteristic of the second phase of his authorship. A self-denial of a merely human scope reasons as follows. Give up your selfish wishes, dreams, and plans, and you will be honored and respected and loved as just and wise. It is not difficult to see that this form of self-denial does not reach God, but remains on the worldly plane of a relationship between men. Christian self-denial reasons as follows. Give up your selfish wishes and desires. Give up your selfish plans and purposes. Become the servant of the good in true disinterestedness of spirit and prepare to find yourself hated and scorned and derided just on that account, precisely as if you were a criminal. Or rather, do not merely prepare to find yourself in this situation, for that may be necessary, but choose it of your own free will. For Christian self-denial knows what will happen beforehand and chooses the consequences voluntarily. Human self-denial rushes into danger without regard for the consequences, but the danger into which it rushes is one in which honor awaits the victor, and the admiration of his fellow men beckons the daring hero and urges him on. It is easy to see that this form of self-denial does not reach God, but it is delayed on the way losing itself in the relativities of human life. Christian self-denial also rushes into danger without regard for the consequences, but the danger is one which the environment cannot interpret as yielding any honor to the victor because the environment is itself blinded, ensnared, guilty. Thus the Christian is confronted by a double danger, for the derision of the spectator awaits the hero, whether he wins or loses. End of that quotation. Chapter 7 A volume of literary criticism devoted to the interpretation of a Danish novel and notable for its characterization of the contemporary age as against the background of the revolutionary period followed close upon the publication of the unscientific postscript. From the beginning, Kierkegaard's plan had not included a distinctively religious authorship, but rather an introduction to such an authorship. The underlying religious motivation was something he had intended to express by taking a charge as a clergyman in some country parish. But now, influenced partly by the trouble with the Corsair, partly by a sense of his own unfitness for an official position, and partly by the acquired momentum of his productive impulse, he determined to devote himself to religious writing. And thus his authorship entered upon its second phase. To the first half of this period belong Edifying Discourses, 1847, the Works of Love, 1848, and Christian Discourses, 1848. Though each religious discourse is complete in itself, the individual themes are logically connected, and the methodical and systematic advance so noticeably characteristic of the ascetic productions finds its counterpart also here, in a gradual approach to more and more concrete conceptions and to an increasingly severe judgment of the actual contemporary life in the light of the ideals delineated. Edifying Discourses deals in a first section with the unity of the ethical ideal. Quote, that the heart can be clean only when it has a single aim. End quote. And that this singleness of aim is possible only to one who chooses the good and actual only when he chooses the good in truth. In a second section, 
with the lessons to be learned from the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, contentment with our common humanity, an appreciation of its glory, and an understanding of its blessedness, which consists in first seeking the kingdom of God, and thirdly, with the gospel of suffering, quote, the happiness to be derived from the thought of following Christ, end quote. Quote, how the burden can be light, though the sorrow is heavy. End quote. Quote, that the school of suffering prepares for eternity. End quote. Quote, that it is not the way which is narrow, but the narrowness which is the way. End quote. Quote, that in relation to God we always suffer as those who are guilty. End quote. Quote, that eternity outweighs in its blessedness even the heaviest temporal suffering, end quote. And, quote, that the spirit of courage and suffering takes power away from the world and transforms derision into honor, defeat into victory, end quote. The Works of Love presents the elaboration of a social ethic on the basis of Christianity. It makes no attempt to formulate an ideal organization of society, nor does it so much as even give a suggestion of a hint of any external polity. But it deals profoundly with the attitude of the individual toward his fellow men. These are Christian reflections, says the preface, and therefore not about love, but about the works of love. They concern the works of love, not as if all its works were herein enumerated and described, far from it, not as if the particular works herein described were now described once for all, praise God that this is impossible, for that which in its whole wealth is essentially inexhaustible is also in its least expression essentially indescribable, because it is essentially present everywhere in its wholeness, and essentially incapable of being described. End of quotation. The beauty and the simplicity of the language, the tender persuasiveness of the idealism, and the universality of its appeal, make this perhaps the most popular of all Kierkegaard's religious writings. It forms a striking contribution to the world's sermonic literature. Christian Discourses contains in the first part a treatment of the anxieties of the pagan mind. Quote, the anxieties of poverty, of wealth, of lowliness, of high position, of presumption, of self-torture, of doubt, inconstancy and despair. End quote. Devoting a discourse to each. Second, a series of discourses on the Christian gospel of suffering. Third, a number of discourses critical of the prevailing religious situation under the caption, quote, Thoughts which wound from behind in order to edify, end quote. And fourth, a treatment in sermonic form of the Christian doctrine of the atonement. Seven discourses on the Lord's Supper. The following significant motto is attached to the third section. Quote, Christianity needs no defense and cannot be served by means of any defense. Christianity is always on the offensive. To defend Christianity is the most indefensible of all distortions of it, the most confusing and the most dangerous. It is unconsciously and cunningly to betray it. Christianity is always on the offensive, and Christendom, consequently, it attacks from behind. End quote. Here we meet with the first definite anticipation of the attack, which Kierkegaard was soon to make upon the open or tacit assumption, current in Christendom, of an established Christian order. A little ascetic article from Kierkegaard's pen, The Crisis in the Life of an Actress, 
saw the light in a Copenhagen journal during the summer of 1848 to serve notice upon the public that his exclusive devotion to religious themes for the past two or three years did not have its ground in an obtuseness to ascetic values. In the spring of the following year there were published anonymously two remarkable theological essays. Has a man the right to allow himself to be put to death for the truth? And the difference between a genius and an apostle? the former with an indirect bearing upon the atonement, and the latter attempting to clear up the Christian concept of authority. To the second half of Kierkegaard's religious authorship may be assigned the following volumes. The Sickness Unto Death, 1849, Practical Introduction to Christianity, 1850, and For Self-Examination, 1851. In these writings, Kierkegaard presents the Christian teaching in its highest ideality, and with a reference to the prevailing state of religion in the Christian world. The ideal is presented sharply and clearly, without compromise. But the consequent judgment on Christendom is formulated as gently as possible, urging nothing but admissions in the interests of sincerity. Quote, in order that we may learn to take refuge in grace, even with respect to the manner in which we use grace. End quote. The sickness unto death marks the appearance of a new pseudonym, Anticlimacus. The standard for human life here delineated that Kierkegaard did not wish to present it in his own name and character, as if his personal existence embodied it. It was therefore presented in the light of a poetic and imaginative rendering, for the ideal ought at least to be heard, under which Kierkegaard wished to humiliate himself, qua reader. Too much the poet to be a reformer, he preferred to present himself as a spy in the service of the ideals, his mission being the Socratic one of detecting and exposing illusions. The journals from these years show the intensity of his feeling about what passes for Christianity in Christendom, his unmeasured contempt for its paltriness and its mediocrity. They disclose also the long-continued self-examination which preceded all these publications, and his anxious fear, lest he should assume too high and authoritative a role, and say more than he had a right to utter. The practical introduction, for example, was written in 1848, but held back from publication for two years, while Kierkegaard was debating in what form it ought to appear, or if it ought to appear at all. It was finally published as by the pseudonym Anticlimacus, and the preface virtually appeals to the authorities of the Danish church to make the admission that the religion preached and practiced in the church was really a modification, several degrees lower than the Christianity of the New Testament. With such a concession publicly made by the highest authority, Kierkegaard felt that the established order could be made to embody a sufficient measure of sincerity and truth, so that it would be unnecessary for him, at least, to make any open attack upon it. No such admission was forthcoming, and Bishop Minster found means to let Kierkegaard know, indirectly, that he regarded the practical introduction in the light of a vicious and dangerous exaggeration, not to say distortion, of Christian teaching. But he refused to discuss the matter with Kierkegaard personally, and publicly maintained silence. The Sickness Unto Death is a psychological study of despair in its various forms, conscious and unconscious. Its point of view is that despair is a universal disease of the spirit, so that every man who has not been cured of it suffers from it, whether he knows it or not. And despair is an imperfect expression of sin. On a higher level of consciousness, despair reveals itself as the consciousness of sin. 
the practical introduction is perhaps the clearest and most precise exposition of the christian dogma in its pragmatic significance and meaning for life to be found in any literature it was published in a form carefully calculated in its bearing upon the concrete contemporary situation in denmark for self-examination two series of discourses of which the second was not published until after kierkegaard's death presents a critical estimate of lutheran protestantism acknowledging the significance of luther's mission as a corrective but condemning modern protestantism for taking advantage of luther's one-sidedness to leave out the deeper ethical implications of christianity ignoring the requirement of following christ and quote, taking the grace of god in vain end quote. the ideas which were to play a part in the grandiose agitation that followed some years later as the climax of kierkegaard's career were now laid down in the religious literature as a whole but as yet they were brought to bear at a distance from the actual situation in the form of imaginative delineations suggesting no other requirement to the reader than concession admission and personal humiliation under the ideal end of recording scandinavian studies and notes volume six number seven Søren kierkegaard by david f swenson university of minnesota Editor A. M. Sturdivant, February 1920, Chapter 7 and 8, pages 27 through 36.